Okay guys, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the first part of a five-part lecture series over blood. So if you look at the beginning of each chapter, you get a breakdown of what the chapters go over. So blood is the internal transport system of the body and the job of the cardiovascular system essentially is to transport material around the body. So we're going to begin this discussion by asking what does blood do? What's blood made of? Then we're going to look at blood plasma. Then we're going to look at the formed elements and draw a focal point to erythrocytes. The next two lectures are going to be over leukocytes and then platelets, specifically looking at what are called blood clotting pathways, which ultimately feeds into these learning objectives here. So that's what we're going to be going over in the next four lectures. As always, I've provided you with a set of learning objectives. Live them, love them. They're a good guide to going through each of these. As always, I would have your handout out and available so you can take notes and answer questions as we go through the lectures or have it up digitally so you can take notes and answer questions as we go through it. Remember that those handouts form the basis of what you can consider kind of a study guide. So they help you to extract the important information from each lecture. So why does this matter? And let's go ahead and listen to this guy. There is one tissue that clinicians examine more than any other when trying to determine the causes of disease in their patients. This tissue is the blood. Blood is the only fluid tissue in the body and accounts for approximately 8% of your body weight. It serves as a transport vehicle for the circulatory system, acting out many critical functions in the body, which include delivering oxygen from the lungs and nutrients from the digestive tract to body cells. When a blood vessel is damaged and causes your patient to bleed, cells within the blood form clots. This process halts further blood loss from the body and is called the hemostasis response. As a healthcare professional, it's critical that you understand the process of the hemostasis response so that you can help your patients prevent abnormal blood clots in their body. For example, a patient who remains in a hospital bed for an extended period of time may develop blood clots in their legs. These clots are known as deep vein thrombosis or DVTs. The danger of this type of blood clot is that a piece of it could break off and travel to the lungs causing a pulmonary embolism or even death. You can help your patients prevent these conditions by encouraging them to be active, whether that means walking if possible or exercising in their bed as their condition permits. Exercise helps the patient's veins push blood back up to the heart, keeping it from sitting where clots are likely to form. A solid understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the blood will enable you to help your patients prevent dangerous blood clots like DVTs. So the guy's not lying. As clinicians, we look at blood all the time. In fact, what do you usually do when you go to a pathology clinic and you get a test done? You have a blood draw and that blood is sent off to a lab like CPL labs in order to uh, analyze it for whatever they're going to analyze it for. So having a basic understanding of blood is important in understanding clinical medicine as a whole. So we're in the cardiovascular system section, and when you think about the organs of the cardiovascular system, the first organ I want you to be familiar with is the heart. The heart is essentially a muscular pump that rhythmically contracts and relaxes in order to push blood through a series of blood vessels. The blood vessels we're going to be going over are arteries. Arteries are blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Arteries feed into smaller blood vessels called arterioles, which we'll talk about later. Those are essentially little arteries that carry blood to the most abundant and most important blood vessel, which is a capillary. Capillaries are the point of exchange. At capillaries, oxygen and nutrients are delivered to tissue. Carbon dioxide and metabolic waste are picked up from tissue, and this... CO2, uh, metabolic waste-rich blood, is returned back to the heart via blood vessels called veins. Now, the transport vehicle for everything, because the job of the cardiovascular system is to move stuff around, the transport vehicle, meaning the stuff that gets moved around, is blood. So when we think about blood, blood has three primary categories of function. It has a transport function, has a regulation function, and it has a protection function. Now, when you think about blood, what we're looking at over here is blood flowing through an artery. And you see these red blood cells. You also see those little fragments. Those are platelets. Over here, you see a blood clot that's formed. So when you think about the function of blood, 
Red blood cells, these kind of donut-shaped cells, we call them biconcave discs, are responsible for moving oxygen from the lungs, right, to the cells that make up tissues. So red blood cells move or transport oxygen around. Red blood cells in plasma then move carbon dioxide that's a metabolic byproduct of cellular respiration from the cells in the tissue back to the lungs. Plasma also transports things like mineral and nutrients. It transports metabolic waste to the kidney and the liver for removal. It transports chemical messengers such as hormones from glands to target cells. So function number one is transport, and within that, we're talking about the transport of a wide array of things, gases, minerals, nutrients, chemical signaling molecules. Blood also serves a regulatory function, so it's a major regulator of body temp. If you think about the regulation of body temp when you're, for example, really hot, you'll notice your skin, if you have a lighter skin tone, gets really red. That's because the capillary networks are dilating. Those blood vessels near the skin are dilating in order to dissipate heat off. Uh, blood also plays a major role in regulating pH through the use of buffering systems. And finally, we have protection. So if there is a break in the side of a blood vessel wall so we don't lose that fluid out of the cardiovascular system into the surrounding tissue, we have clotting pathways that prevent the loss of fluid and therefore maintain blood volume. And we also have floating through the blood white blood cells. And white blood cells are immune cells that mediate immune responses. They usually travel around within the cardiovascular system, meaning in blood vessels, but eventually they'll work their way out of blood vessels to surrounding tissues if those tissues give the appropriate chemical signal that there's some kind of problem taking place there. Now, when you think about the components that make up whole blood, so if we were to take blood, and in this case we're taking venous blood, we put it into a tube, and we put that tube into a machine called a centrifuge that spins around really quickly. Whole blood is what's called a heterogeneous mixture, not a homogeneous, like Coca-Cola is a homogeneous mixture, meaning the particles have a roughly equal density to the solvent, and therefore they remain equally distributed and they don't really settle down. So you can put Coke on a shelf and a month later you can come back and all of those solutes will be pretty much equally distributed still. That's a homogeneous mixture. That's not blood. Blood is what's called a heterogeneous mixture or a suspension mixture. That means the components in blood have different densities and if blood's allowed to sit or you put it into a machine like a centrifuge in which inertial forces separate things based on density, you get different components to that whole blood. So when you're thinking about whole blood, if you put it into a centrifuge and then you pulled it out, this tube out of the centrifuge, the different components of whole blood would separate out based on density. At the very top, you would see a straw-colored fluid that accounts for anywhere from 55 to 60 percent of whole blood or 55 to 65 percent of whole blood, and this is called blood plasma. Now, blood plasma is the least dense component. It is where you find dissolved solutes. It's what's called an aqueous solution. So all of the solutes like nutrients, vitamins, minerals, chemical signaling molecules, metabolic waste, they're all dissolved in the plasma. And that's how that material gets transported around. In the middle, at an intermediate density, you get something called the Buffy coat. The Buffy coat is made up of white blood cells and platelets, which account for less than 1% of whole blood, or 1% or less. So white blood cells, aka leukocytes, are responsible for mediating immune responses, and we're going to discuss those in more detail in the next lecture. And then platelets, or thrombocytes, are responsible for mediating blood clotting responses. Toward the very bottom, what you see are red blood cells. Red blood cells, or erythrocytes, erythro meaning red and site meaning cell, account for anywhere from 38 to 52 percent of whole blood, depending on who you are. And the job of erythrocytes, or red blood cells, is they're filled with a protein called hemoglobin, which has iron on it. That's why they're so dense. That's why they sink to the bottom. It's like taking an iron and dropping it in a bathtub. The iron's going to sink to the bottom. And their job is to transport oxygen around the body. So red blood, blood cells transport oxygen to the cells that need them, and they transport carbon dioxide away from the cells that's a byproduct of cellular respiration. Now, when you look at whole blood under a histological smear, 
What you are looking at out here is the blood plasma. So filling these little nooks and crannies, that's the extracellular matrix. That's blood plasma, right? It's a, a fluid connective tissue, if you remember from your histology a little while ago. Now, we haven't gone over white blood cells yet, so don't worry about the specific fields. These are leukocytes or white blood cells. And then these little biconcave discs, they almost look like little uh, rubber tubes, right, or donuts, are red blood cells. These little dots you see here are the cell fragments called platelets that are responsible for mediating blood clotting responses, which we'll talk about in lecture four. So learning objective four, what are the physical characteristics and volume of blood? So blood's a sticky, opaque fluid with a metallic taste. The reason blood has a metallic taste is because there's iron in the hemoglobin. So if you've ever tasted blood and it's tasted a little metallic to you, it's because there's iron in it. The color of blood varies with O2 content, which is really important with respect to getting a pulse ox reading, right? What's the oxygen saturation of blood? Because essentially what a pulse oximeter does is it looks at the color of blood or the relative color of the, the uh, light, the absorption spectrum. So high O2 levels show kind of scarlet red. So if you're looking at a tube like this, what you're probably looking at is arterial blood. And then low O2 levels show dark red. If you're looking at a tube like this, you're probably looking at venous blood. Oxygen rich, oxygen poor. The oxygenation status of the red blood cells influences their color. The pH, normal pH of blood, is between 7.5 and 7.45. Makes up approximately 8% of anybody's body weight at any given time. And men have about 5 to 6 liters, while females have about 4 to 5 liters. Now... When you think about whole blood, remember, if we were to put blood in a centrifuge and separate it out, in this case in a microcapillary tube, which is what we would have been doing in lab, the different components of whole blood separate out based on density. So the least dense at the top here is blood plasma. So we call this a fluid air interface. This isn't plasma here, that's just empty tube. From here to the top of the buffy coat represents the plasma, right? Then you have the red blood cells, which are packed at the bottom, and that little tiny layer you see right there is the white blood cells and platelets, which you can see right here, which account for 1% or less of whole blood. Now, this thing at the end is what's called a clay plug. You put the clay plug into the microcapillary tube in order to prevent it from spattering blood when you put it in the centrifuge. It's not physiologically relevant. I mention that because if you make any measurements of a microcapillary tube, you never include the clay plug or the air in your measurement. You include the column of blood and the specific factor in the blood you're interested in. Now, blood plasma is what's called an aqueous solution. It's made up of water with about 7 to 8% solutes. Those solutes include things like ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, right? All of the different ions floating around in your blood are dissolved in that blood plasma. Organic molecules such as amino acids, which are necessary for protein synthesis, functional proteins, we're going to go over two types of functional proteins today, sugars, lipids, nitrogenous waste, meaning metabolic waste from tissue that's going to be taken to the kidneys for elimination. Then we get things like uh, vitamins and minerals, things like vitamin C, the B vitamins, which, you know, if you have too many of them can make your urine almost this kind of like bright yellow, almost fluorescent looking color. Um, gases, a little bit of O2, more CO2. O2 is predominantly transported around by red blood cells. So we have blood plasma, and that's going to be the first component we talk about today. Now, if we're thinking about blood plasma, you can kind of read through and figure out the relative uh, functional roles of blood plasma. And we've talked about all this, right? The last one there is all of those hormones, right? Chemical messengers, when they're moving around in the body, need to be transported by blood plasma. So we have our electrolytes, meaning ions, things like sodium, potassium, magnesium. We have our plasma proteins. We're going to be discussing two of those today, the albumins and the globulins. We have clotting proteins. We have 
uh, substances that need to be eliminated as waste. We have nutrients, we have gases, we have signaling molecules. So go through and read through that because when you think about the delivery of nutrients and chemical signaling molecules to cells and the removal of metabolic waste from cells, where that's happening, the vehicle for that is the blood plasma specifically. Now, when you think about a biochemistry panel, it's often just called a chem panel, what you are looking at is the concentration of all of these different things in the blood plasma. So you're looking at sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, sodium, potassium ratio, nutrients such as glucose, uh, metabolic waste such as urea, nitrogen, and creatinine, metabolic byproducts of, for example, liver enzymes like ALT and AST, right? Cholesterol, which is a fat, iron. We're looking at all of these things, but we're looking at them in the blood. And remember, you always read a lab by looking at the reference range and looking at the patient value and then looking to see if there are deviations that can tell you something important about that patient's condition. Let me tell you, Electrolyte balance in the blood is really, really important, and we'll really delve into that when we get into fluid and electrolyte balance, but that's just emphasizing why we care about blood, why we, why we need to know about blood as clinicians, because it's the, the substance we evaluate to look for markers of disease. So when you think about blood, cardiovascular 101, you have the heart, it's pumping, Heart moves blood into a series of blood vessels called arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. They branch into arterioles, whereas arteries are macroscopic. You can see them with the unaided eye. Arterioles are microscopic. They're called part of your microcirculation. Arterioles then feed into capillaries. Capillaries are the smallest, most abundant, and most important type of blood vessel because that's where exchange is taking place. And capillaries are so small, in fact, that individual capillaries, not networks of capillaries, but individual capillaries are so small that red blood cells kind of have to squeeze through one at a time. So here's my picture of a capillary where you're looking at the epithelial wall of the capillary, and you're looking at these red blood cells squeezing through one at a time. Now, in here you also have plasma proteins, which I've indicated with these little guys here. And to get an idea of what that really looks like, this is a capillary running through some connective tissue. Now, why are capillaries so important? Capillaries are the point of exchange, the point of nutrient exchange, the point of gas exchange, the point of waste exchange. So transport throughout the cardiovascular system is useless unless the cardiovascular system can exchange material with the surrounding cells of the tissue. And that's what happens at the level of capillaries. So when you look at a capillary wall, capillary walls tend to have little openings in them, right? And if blood is flowing through here with a little bit of pressure, the blood plasma in the cardiovascular system inside the capillary, some of it gets pushed across into the surrounding area called the interstitial space. The moment that plasma is pushed across the capillary wall and it moves from being inside the capillary into the interstitial space, it's no longer called blood plasma, it's called interstitial fluid. And only small water-soluble things fit across those little holes. So red blood cells, proteins don't get pushed across, but small water-soluble things like chemical signaling molecules, nutrients, gases do. The movement of plasma out of a blood vessel, specifically a capillary into the surrounding space, is called filtration. And filtration creates interstitial fluid. Then we deliver that good stuff to the cells, right? Things like oxygen and nutrients, and those cells give up that bad stuff, things like carbon dioxide and metabolic waste. <clears throat> carbon dioxide and metabolic waste move out of the interstitial space back into the capillary. So that interstitial fluid, right, then becomes blood plasma again. The movement of interstitial fluid black back into a capillary is called reabsorption. Then that fluid is moved through the cardiovascular system and that waste such as CO2 or the water-soluble um, toxins are taken to the lungs or to the kidney to be eliminated.
So capillaries are the point of exchange and they're tiny little blood vessels, but they're the most abundant and most important type of blood vessel. Any excess interstitial fluid, by the way, is drained by the lymphatic system, which we're going to talk about this semester as well. So now that we have a basic understanding of what happens at the level of capillaries, let's start talking about blood plasma drawing a focus to our plasma proteins. The most abundant plasma protein is albumin. Albumins account for about 60% of plasma proteins. They are produced by the liver. They are exclusively produced by the liver and they maintain a really important parameter of the blood and specifically blood, the blood plasma called blood colloid osmotic pressure. So blood colloid osmotic pressure. Blood colloid osmotic pressure or BCOP is what prevents fluid from leaking out of capillaries at an un, like uncontrollably ultimately producing edema in your tissues or the buildup of fluid in your tissues. In other words, albumin suck fluid back into capillaries in order to prevent too much of that fluid from moving from the cardiovascular system to the interstitial fluid in the surrounding tissues. So when you think about albumins, albumins are synthesized in the liver. They account for about 60% of all of your plasma proteins, and they're a functional protein. Primary function number one that I want you to be aware of is they maintain something called blood colloid osmotic pressure, and that prevents blood from essentially leaking out of your cardiovascular system into your surrounding tissues and causing edema. So when you look at this image here, right, these little blue things are water molecules, and what you're looking at here is the interstitial space, the space surrounding cells. And what you're looking at down here is a blood vessel. We'll call it a capillary. Now, remember that there's filtration, the movement of plasma through the capillary wall into the surrounding interstitial space. And there's reabsorption. And they have to roughly balance out. One of the factors that plays an important role in reabsorption, sucking things back up at the level of the capillary networks are the proteins called albumins. If you remember, water essentially follows non-penetrant solute or water follows solute. So albumins, like all proteins, carry a negative charge. That negative charge attracts sodium. Where sodium moves, so too does water. And that creates an osmotic pressure that sucks water back into the blood vessel, back into the capillary, preventing you from losing all your water at the level of capillaries, right? If you're suffering, for example, from a type of starvation, uh, it's called kwashiorkor, which is a protein starvation, one of the first things to go is the liver stops producing albumins because you prioritize different proteins to make if you're protein deficient. When albumin stop being made, we lose this mechanism of sucking fluid out of the surrounding space, right? Our BCOP decreases. So we can't reabsorb fluid in the tissue quite as effectively anymore. And when you can't reabsorb fluid in the tissue, tissues such as the, uh, you know, tissues of the GI tract essentially get inundated with fluid and what you actually see is edema. So whenever you see belly edema, for example, in a child, right, that's indicative of protein starvation and it's because albumins are not as abundant. The blood colloid osmotic pressure has gone down and you can't suck up fluid from the surrounding area back into the blood vessels quite as effectively. We're going to talk about that big time when we get into capillary exchange. For now, no albumins maintain something called blood colloid osmotic pressure that prevents fluid from leaking out of blood vessels. That's really important. Another thing albumins do is they transport fat-soluble substances or lipid-soluble substances. Lipid-soluble compounds can't move around the body directly in the blood plasma. They can't dissolve in blood plasma because blood plasma is primarily water. Likes dissolve likes. Only polar molecules can dissolve in polar solvents like water. So anything that's nonpolar, right, or lipid-soluble can't dissolve in blood plasma, but it needs to move around in the body. And the way that it does that is albumins essentially form a transport vehicle and they move those substances around because albumins, which are proteins, are soluble in water. So if I was to use an analogy, my name is Matt. Matt is to Toyota Corolla as blank is to blank. 
Well, I would be like the Lipid, and my Toyota Corolla would be like the Albumin. It carries me around, right? It moves me about from point A to point B. That's what albumins do to things like fatty acids, to certain types of medications, to steroid hormones, to bilirubin, to uh, plasma tryptophan. They move it around. And that's a really important function. So what you're looking at here, all these little jagged lines represent the three-dimensional shape of the albumin protein in the plasma. And these guys, right, are essentially those lipid-soluble molecules that the albumin is transporting around. It's a little vehicle to move those things around. Globulins, on the other hand, are split into three categories. What we're going to be focusing on today are the alpha and beta globulins. Alpha and beta globulins are synthesized exclusively in the liver. So alpha and beta globulins are synthesized in the liver. And what they do is globulins serve a wide range of roles. One of the most important is they are also transport vehicles for fat-soluble substances. They are also transport vehicles for fat-soluble substances, notably steroid hormones. So when you're looking at this protein over here, what you're looking at is a globulin. And whenever you see the one, two, three, four rings, you know you're looking at a steroid. This particular globulin is called sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin is responsible for moving testosterone and estrogen around the body. If, and we're going to talk about this um, at some point, I hope, but if you ever get a test to look at your sex hormone levels, like your testosterone levels or your estrogen levels, especially you men out there, but this applies equally to women, right? Sex hormone binding globulin is a really important metric. You can have, this is called bound hormone. So this hormone isn't free to be used until it unbinds and is delivered to the cells. So you could have a really low level of free hormone, like free testosterone. Your free testosterone could be really low, but your sex hormone binding globulin could be really high. So you have plenty of testosterone. It's all just being locked up by this protein. In other words, it's an important part of the diagnostic metric that's used. So those are your globulins. We have the alpha and beta globulins, again, also synthesized by the liver. Now, we're not going to look at fibrinogen until we get into the... Uh, hemostatic pathways, the blood loss pathways. So when you're looking at your blood plasma here, you have plasma proteins. Of those plasma proteins, we've talked about albumins and we've talked about globulins. Make sure to pay attention to what learning objectives we're on. The albumins and globulins are covered in learning objective six. So learning objective seven, red blood cell function. So now we're done talking about the blood plasma and we've shifted our focus to red blood cells. When you look at red blood cells, red blood cells are shaped like little biconcave discs and they're essentially sacs of a protein called hemoglobin. And what red blood cells do is they transport oxygen from the lungs to the cells of your tissues. So we're going to go over here and we're going to trace this guy real quick. You see that drop of blood? We're looking at one red blood cell goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, returns back from the lungs to the left side of the heart, then gets pumped through the body, moves through the body, delivers that oxygen to the tissue, picks up carbon dioxide, takes that carbon dioxide rich blood back to the lungs to be eliminated, and the whole process starts over again. The job of red blood cells is to move oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the tissue in your body, the cells in the tissues that make up your body, and then the carbon dioxide from the cells of the tissues of your body back to the lungs so we can exhale it. So when we inhale, we inhale to get oxygen. That oxygen is delivered. When we exhale, we exhale to get rid of carbon dioxide. And this is a really good graphic because it's just tracing out what's happening in a red blood cell. So that O2 uh, poor carbon dioxide rich blood is returning back to the heart, back to the lungs. Exhale carbon dioxide, inhale the oxygen. That oxygen rich blood is then being delivered out to the cells of the tissue. And that's what red blood cells do. Now, why do we have carbon dioxide in the first place? Well, let's look at the interconnected links of life here just for a moment at the chemical level.
So chloroplasts are found in plants, and everything at the end of the day, right, is the, the energy we get ultimately derives from sunlight, right? Because whether you're eating meat or whether you're eating vegetables, photosynthesis forms the basis of all food chains or food uh, networks or food webs. So plants, right, use energy from the sun, and they take energy from the sun and they use that to break and make bonds and they take carbon dioxide and water plus energy from the sun and they rearrange those bonds to form glucose and oxygen. So when you're thinking of where glucose and oxygen come from, glucose and oxygen come from plants. They come from photosynthesis. That's how they're made. Then animal cells take up glucose and oxygen. We burn glucose in the presence of oxygen in these little structures in our cells called mitochondria in order to produce ATP. That's called cellular respiration. So the moment that O2 is delivered to the cells, it enters into a pathway of cellular respiration. We burn glucose in the presence of oxygen, right, in order to make ATP, the byproducts of which are carbon dioxide and water. So we inhale in order to get oxygen, to fuel the process of burning glucose. So we burn glucose in the presence of oxygen to make energy. The byproducts of burning oxygen, like, just like the byproducts of burning gasoline, are carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is then eliminated, right, when we exhale, and then it sucks back up again by plants that take water and carbon dioxide and use it to make sugar and oxygen. And those are the cycles of life. So, whoop. When you think about the functional role of red blood cells, red blood cells are responsible for transporting oxygen around the body. When you look at this, this is representing a microcapillary tube that's been sun, spun down in the process of centrifugation, right? So inertial forces have separated out these different components of whole blood. What we're looking at up here, this straw-colored fluid is blood plasma. We're looking at the Buffy coat, which consists of uh, white blood cells and platelets. All of the cellular components of blood, by the way, are referred to as formed elements. These formed elements, if you recall from the skeletal system, are made in red bone marrow. So all of the cellular components of blood, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, all of these cellular components, aka formed elements, are made in red bone marrow, right? They are synthesized in red bone marrow. And then from the red bone marrow, they're delivered into the cardiovascular system where they can serve their respective role. At the moment, we are talking about red blood cells. And we know that red blood cells deliver oxygen to tissues. And we know that we need oxygen because we burn glucose in the presence of oxygen to make energy in the form of ATP. In other words, you need oxygen to make energy, period. You need oxygen to make energy. So red blood cells are really important in energy pathways. We need oxygen to make energy. Every cell in your body needs oxygen to make energy. The hematocrit is a measure that we're going to take when we come into lab, which is essentially the percent of red blood cells in whole blood. So hematocrit represents the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood, or the percent of whole blood that's made up exclusively of red blood cells. And one of the things we're going to be doing in the lab is we're going to be determining hematocrit in order to make diagnostic decisions. So if I was to take a ruler and I was to measure this entire height of this blood column, which is what we'd be doing, by the way, if we were to take a little microcapillary tube, we'd take a ruler, we wouldn't measure the clay plug, and we'd measure from the bottom of the blood column to the top of the blood column. So let's say we measure from the bottom to the top of the blood column in millimeters, and the entire or the whole column of blood is 100 millimeters, right? Then we would measure from the top, the, from the bottom to the top of the column that's made up exclusively of red blood cells. And what we would do if we were determining hematocrit, if this was 100 millimeters and the height of the column that was just red blood cells was 42 millimeters, we'd take 42 millimeters and we'd divide it by 100 millimeters and that would give us 0 0.42, which as a percent decimal is 42%.
Hematocrit, because millimeters cancel out or whatever unit of length you're using cancels out, hematocrit, right, the unit is percent, and it represents the percent of whole blood that's made up just of red blood cells. So think about this equation, because on the exam, you're going to have to calculate hematocrit. You're going to be given numbers, and you're going to have to calculate hematocrit based on those numbers. Maybe I say this is 42 millimeters, this is a millimeter, this is 58 millimeters, then you'd have to add the three together to get the height of the whole column, and then you'd have to divide the height of the red blood cell column by the height of the whole column to get the percent. <clears throat> hematocrit is a really important measure. So if we look at a normal hematocrit, anywhere from 38 to 55 percent, 52 to 55 percent, depending on if you're male or female, it's the height of the column that's made up just of red blood cells. Now, in some cases, hematocrit can be reduced. When hematocrit's reduced, right, when the number of red blood cells decreases, that condition is called anemia. When hematocrit is elevated beyond a reference range, that condition is called polycythemia. So you have anemia and polycythemia, which are the two conditions you diagnose, essentially, doing a hematocrit. Now, when we think about causes of anemia, there are a multitude of potential causes for anemia. So you have excessive bleeding, like along your uh, colorectal tract, right? You might get a little bit of blood in your fecal matter every time you use the bathroom and not even notice it, but slowly red blood cells are leaching out and not being replaced at the same rate plasma is hematocrit drops. Menstrual bleeding. Most menstrual fluid is not blood. It's endometrial tissue. It's tissue that's uh, popping out, and that's why it has kind of a chunky texture to it. But every now and again, you can get excessive menstrual bleeding and lose blood, net blood. Iron deficiency, because iron is necessary to make hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is necessary to make red blood cells. If you're iron deficient, you're not going to be able to crank out red blood cells. Hematocrit's going to go down. Cancers, certain cancers can cause anemia. Genetic factors like, uh, you know, uh, thalassemia can cause anemia. Impaired metabolism. So there are all sorts of causes of anemia. And <clears throat> one of the things you'll notice with anemia is if a patient comes in and they're anemic, they have skin pallor right? They'll have skin pallor, and they may have a low heart rate, and they may, you know, complain of muscular weakness. But at the end of the day, one of the most frequent subjective complaints is fatigue, lethargy and fatigue, right? They just feel zonked out. They feel pooped out all the time, right? And it makes a lot of sense if you think about what red blood cells do. Red blood cells transport oxygen to tissues. Oxygen is necessary to burn glucose for energy, Less red blood cells means less oxygen in tissues. Less ex oxygen in tissues means less energy. Less energy translates into fatigue, lethargy, and all this constellation of symptoms you can potentially see with anemia depending on severity. Makes a lot of sense. How do you diagnose it? You get the hematocrit. When hematocrit's low, that's called anemia. It means the number of red blood cells has been reduced. When hematocrit is high, that's called polycythemia. So... We break those into relative and absolute. Ironically, the relative is the most common. So the most common co reason that you'll have an elevated hematocrit is due to something like dehydration. You lose water but not red blood cells, and therefore the ratio of red blood cells to plasma changes and hematocrit spikes. But you can have things like artificial EPO injected, um, changes in oxygen saturation, like if you smoke your hematocrit will go up because oxygen levels in your blood are going down and your body's trying to compensate, uh, a splenectomy, blood doping. There are a bunch of different um, potential causes of polycythemia. Taking hormones like testosterone replacement therapy, all sorts. <laughs> so on an exam, you're definitely going to get a microcapillary tube right? And next to that microcapillary tube, you're going to have a ruler. And that ruler is going to extend from here to here. I want you to know you don't measure the clay portion, the clay plug. It would be pointless to do that. And I would expect you to make the measurements necessary to make an appropriate diagnosis. Is it uh, a nor is hematocrit normal or within reference range? Is it low and is it anemia? Is it high? Is it polycythemia? The reason polycythemia is dangerous is 
Red blood cells have a very thick consistency to them, kind of like honey. So as the concentration of red blood cells goes up, the blood becomes thicker. The viscosity or the thickness of the blood increases. So it's like trying to pump honey through your cardiovascular system, and that can be really hard on your cardiovascular system for a multitude of reasons. Now, when you look at the anatomy of a red blood cell, if we look at a side cut, notice that it's anucleated, one of the few uh, cell groups in your body that doesn't have a nuclei. It's a biconcave disc, meaning it has this depression in the middle, right? And it's essentially just a sac of hemoglobin. The biconcave disc aspect, the fact that it's thinner in the middle here, it kind of tubes in at the middle, kind of like a donut, is really important because one, <clears throat> the biconcave nature increases the surface area available for gas exchange, so there's more area available for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And two, having this little depression in the middle allows red blood cells to fold in half almost like little tortillas. And when you think about that from a functional perspective, red blood cells, when they're fitting through capillary networks sometimes because the capillaries are so small, need to physically actually fold in order to fit through those capillary networks. So that shape allows them to do that. If it was, think about folding an inner tube in half as opposed to a beach ball. You can't really fold a beach ball in half. You can fold an inner tube in half. So those are two important aspects of the shape, like the adaptive significance. Now, when you look at a red blood cell, so here's our entire red blood cell. It's filled with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein. So during erythropoiosis, which is the formation of red blood cells, poiosis is formation of, erythrio is red. So erythropoiosis is the formation of red blood cells. During that formation, in the early stages, these cells have a nuclei. The nuclei has DNA. Within those DNA, you have genes for the different chains on the hemoglobin molecule. So it's a quaternary, meaning it has four different peptide chains that come together to form the functional protein hemoglobin. The alpha chains and the beta chains. The alpha and beta chains, right, come together, and in the middle of each one of them, there's what's called a heme group. At the center of that heme group, there's iron. So these proteins are made through the process of transcription or tra and translation, gene expression. And after the cell fills up with hemoglobin, the nucleus is kicked out. So it goes, it gets booted out. And after that, these are essentially just sacks of hemoglobin. So within every red blood cell, there's anywhere from 5 to 8 million hemoglobin molecules, millions of hemoglobin molecules. And each hemoglobin molecule has one, two, three, four heme groups. Each heme group has a central iron, right? That's what makes red blood cells so dense, is these iron atoms. That's why they sink to the bottom. They're essentially sacks of hemoglobin, and the centerpiece of hemoglobin is iron. Each iron is capable of binding to one molecule of molecular oxygen. So when you think about oxyhemoglobin curves, or hemoglobin saturation, down here we have the partial pressure, the concentration of oxygen, essentially. And here we have what's called oxygen saturation. So when you measure pulse ox in a little machine, <coughs> what you're doing is you're measuring the relative absorption uh, of hemoglobin with certain types of light. Now you don't have to know that for the exam, but let's take a look at what that actually means. So hemoglobin, made of these four chains, four heme groups, four irons, and each iron atom is capable of binding to a molecule of molecular oxygen. So let's say that we're at zero uh, millimeters of mercury of oxygen, meaning there's no oxygen around, and if there's no oxygen around, hemoglobin hasn't bound to any oxygen, so it's zero, right? Now let's say we raise this up to about 20, right? So at 20 millimeters of mercury, uh, which is the pressure here, right, the amount of oxygen available, hemoglobin will bind to one molecule of molecular oxygen. When it binds to one molecule of molecular oxygen, its color will change just a little bit from being a dark red to being a lighter red, and we say that that's 25% saturated right, because 25% of the available binding spots have been bound to oxygen. Two, right, so we go up, more oxygen that's available, 
the more oxygen there is to bind to hemoglobin. So at about here, you get 50% saturation. The molecule reflects light that's even a little more red. Then here you get 75% saturation. And here you have 100% saturation. So when you say oxygen saturation is 100%, you mean on average each hemoglobin molecule is saturated with or bound to four molecules of molecular oxygen. So when you take a pulse ox reading and you see this O2 saturation, essentially it's looking at the way that hemoglobin interacts with different types of light. I mention that because we're not measuring hemoglobin directly, we're using an indirect measure of hemoglobin. We're using essentially the color of blood and the absorptive and refractive indices of blood to make an assumption about hemoglobin saturation. You can interfere with this, for example, by putting really dark nail polish on. So if you can't get a good read on someone who has a bunch of nail polish on, right, because that light isn't getting through the nail polish, Another good place to put your pulse oximeter is on somebody's earlobe. So, learning objective 10, erythropoiosis and a focus on anemia and polycythemia. Erythropoiosis is the formation of red blood cells within the red bone marrow that you find in the nooks and cranny of spongy bone. So you should know what red bone marrow is and what spongy bone is. But in spongy bone, right, like at the end of long bones, you find spongy bone. And in that spongy bone, you have red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is a bunch of what are called stem cells, specifically hematopoietic stem cells. Heme means blood, poiosis means formation. A hematopoietic stem cell is a stem cell that forms blood. So where would you find this? You'd find this in red bone marrow. All over the body, right, you find red bone marrow, but you'd find these stem cells in red bone marrow. And what these stem cells do is they respond to different chemical factors in order to go through different processes. So this stem cell, the beauty of stem cells is that this could become anything, right? It depends on what chemicals it's exposed to in the way that it differentiates or becomes whatever cell it's going to become. So at this point, when it's just a stem cell, this could become a white blood cell, it could become a platelet, it could become anything. Now, a hormone released by the kidneys that will actually guide the development of a red blood cell is called EPO. So EPO is a hormone released by the kidneys. It travels to the red bone marrow. So it travels to distant target cells, specifically these stem cells in the red bone marrow. And when EPO binds to receptors on these stem cells, it triggers erythropoiosis, meaning it begins the pathway in which the stem cell will eventually form a mature red blood cell, right? That process in which the stem cell goes from being a stem cell to forming mature red blood cell is called differentiation. The process by which a stem cell produces an erythrocyte or a red blood cell is called erythropoiosis, the formation of red blood cells. So erythropoietin is necessary for this to happen. Anything that increases erythropoietin uh, anything that increases the concentrations of EPO in your blood will increase this pathway and produce more red blood cells. More red, red blood cells mean a higher hematocrit, right? Anything that interferes with the production of EPO will interfere with this pathway, producing less red blood cells, right? Lowering hematocrit. Another key hormonal mediator is thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone just upregulates all the enzymes working in these pathways, and it's necessary to carry out the formation of red blood cells at an appropriate rate or speed. So you need thyroid hormone binding to these cells, upregulating their metabolism so they can carry out all these different processes necessary to form a red blood cell in a, a fat, if quickly, right? If you don't have thyroid hormone, typically these processes slow down, the number of red blood cells in your system decreases, that drops the hematocrit, anemia, right? So we look at this. <clears throat> Remember, this process is taking place in bone marrow. So this is taking place in red bone marrow where you have a bunch of stem cells. So you have hormonal factors that influence it. You also have dietary factors, 
So vitamin B12, for example, is necessary for um, critical aspects of DNA replication. If you don't have vitamin B12, you don't get the DNA replication you need here, and nothing downstream happens. So if you don't get the DNA replication, or you're not handling those DNA processes like you should with respect to cell division, etc., that's going to interfere with this pathway. It's going to produce anemia. You don't get enough folic acid, same thing. Works on DNA, gene expression, etc. Up and down regulates certain types of genes. If you don't have enough of it, this pathway will slow down. It will produce anemia. Intrinsic factor is a mechanism. Intrinsic factor is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12. So some people suffer from what's called pernicious anemia. In pernicious anemia, you don't produce intrinsic factor. If you don't produce intrinsic factor, you can't absorb vitamin B12 along the GI tract. If you can't absorb vitamin B12, you can't make red blood cells anemia right? So these are some nutritional factors particularly important are vitamin B12 and folic acid in erythropoiosis. Then you have other dietary factors like are you getting enough amino acids in the diet? Amino acids are necessary for the production of hemoglobin, right? Remember it's a protein so it's a made of amino acids. If you're not getting an adequate amount of amino acids in the diet, you can't produce enough hemoglobin. If you can't produce enough hemoglobin, the number of erythrocytes decreases. That produces anemia or results in anemia. Iron in the diet. Remember, hemoglobin has four iron atoms attached to every hemoglobin molecule, right? It takes a ton of iron to physically make uh, hemoglobin and it takes a ton of hemoglobin to make a red blood cell so if you can't make hemoglobin this pathway is going to slow down meaning you're not going to be able to make red blood cells that's going to drop the number of red blood cells which is going to drop the hematocrit and produce anemia vitamin C one you need vitamin C to absorb iron along the GI tract in fact you should never take iron without vitamin C you need the two together you can't even absorb iron without vitamin C so for that reason, vitamin C deficiency can produce anemia. Vitamin C is also necessary for the synthesis of hormones. It's a cofactor for a ton of different enzymes, or what's called a coenzyme, meaning it allows really important enzymes in the, the production of proteins to work properly. And if vitamin C isn't there in adequate concentrations, then that's problematic, can result in anemia. Copper necessary for the metabolic or the energetic pathways um, associated with these processes. Don't get enough of that, it can produce anemia. It also plays a role in iron absorption. So you have all sorts of factors. You have hormonal factors, you have nutritional factors that can result in anemia. Then you just have things like injuries. So when we think about EPO, EPO is one of the primary mediators of erythropoiosis. And <clears throat> when you think about the production of EPO, this is a negative feedback pathway, and I want you to kind of understand it so you can understand the questions that I'm going to ask about it on an exam. So let's say homeostasis. You have normal blood oxygen levels, so plenty of blood oxygen. Now, let's say that oxygen levels decrease. Hypoxia sets in, or a decrease in the concentration of oxygen in your blood, in your oxygen saturation. Right? So you get a decreased amount of oxygen. That's called hypoxia. Well, what could cause hypoxia right? in the long term? Things like moving to elevation. Being at a higher elevation can cause hypoxia. Right? That's the basis of things like altitude sickness. Right? Or living at a higher elevation. Sometimes people train at higher elevations to induce hypoxia. Smoking cigarettes can cause hypoxia, right? Because the gas exchange mechanisms in the lungs aren't working quite as well. And two, you're just flooding it with smoke. Uh, lots, of, lots of different things can cause hypoxia. But anyway, hypoxia, right? A decrease in O2 is detected by the kidney. So you have cells in the kidney, right, that detect that. They also function as a control center and they release an effector called erythropoietin or EPO. EPO released by the kidney travels to distant target cells. The target cells of EPO are stem cells in the red bone marrow.
When EPO binds to receptors on the stem cells in the red bone marrow, it upregulates erythropoiosis or the formation of red blood cells. With more red blood cells, more red blood cells are capable of carrying more oxygen. Oxygen levels increase. The stimulus is low oxygen. The response is to increase blood oxygen. This, by definition, is a negative feedback pathway. Right? So when you think about altitude training or blood doping, when EPO was first discovered, so we've known about EPO for a long time, but it was first synthesized for clinical purposes in the 1970s, and it was used to treat anemia in cancer patients, which was a really important medical breakthrough. Treating anemia in cancer patients was a big, big deal, right? But athletes kind of caught on to the fact that you could inject this hormone, and by injecting this hormone, you could actually upregulate the production of red blood cells. So endurance athletes notably caught on to this and started to, I guess you could say, abuse that. So if you're running in a, let's say you're riding the Tour de France, right? And you want to increase your body's oxygen carrying capabilities because you want to deliver more oxygen to your tissues so they don't fatigue as quickly. One of the ways to do that is to increase the number of red blood cells you have in the system. So you can inject EPO. And by injecting EPO, you can upregulate the amount of erythropoiosis that occurs and you can jack up your hematocrit and therefore the oxygen carrying capabilities of your blood, right? <clears throat> and your muscles are less likely to fatigue if there's higher oxygen carrying capabilities. Or you can pull out blood like a month before the race. You can centrifuge it down and you can put it in a fridge and you can separate out the red blood cells. Then... You can have these baggies, and what Lance Armstrong got caught doing, right, was essentially their team was followed by a van, and they had these baggies of red blood cells that had been extracted well before the race, and what they were doing is they were injecting the red blood cells back into themselves so they would avoid detection because they usually take your hematocrit at the beginning of an endurance race like the Tour de France. Hematocrit would go up, and they'd be able to ride, with less fatigue potential in the second, you know, when the in the different legs of the races. That's what blood doping is. Blood doping is artificially elevating your hematocrit to increase the oxygen carrying capabilities of your blood. The irony of that is elevation training does the exact same thing. So if you train at altitude, if you go, for example, to Colorado, right, and induce hypoxia by training at altitude, you're going to kick in this pathway naturally and your hematocrit is going to increase. Then when you come back down to, let's say, sea level and you run a race down here, you will have that increased hematocrit and that increased oxygen carrying capability. So there's the argument to be made of what's the difference. I don't know. So <clears throat> that's polycythemia. So a couple of things that can cause polycythemia, we mentioned them, but blood doping would cause polycythemia. Um, when you focus on polycythemia, you can focus on the production. So we could think of blood doping, artificial EPO stimulation, smoking cigarettes, right? Anything to induce hypoxia like altitude training. Another factor that we can focus on when we focus on polycythemia is the life cycle of a red blood cell because it can tell us what's going on with respect to the life cycle of a red blood cell. So if you look over here in this pathway, erythropoiosis is occurring in the red bone marrow, right? So those stem cells are binding to EPO and being brought through the pathway associated with erythropoiosis where you produce a mature red blood cell at the end of the line. Things that are important like uh, protein in your diet, vitamin B12, the hormone erythropoietin. Red blood cells circulate for about 120 days. They last for about 120 days. When red blood cells get old and worn out, they get stiff. So they're no longer able to fold. And when they get stiff, they get caught in the spleen and in the liver. So when they get stiff, they actually get caught in these filtration networks in the spleen and in the liver. So when the red blood cell gets caught, it undergoes a program, a, a, a phagocytosis. The cells in the liver essentially eat those red blood cells, right? 
So they get caught, they're not fitting through those capillary networks because they're awful stiff, and it initiates breakdown of these cells. When these cells are broken down, the globins, right, the alpha and beta globins, so when you're looking at this, these protein components, so cell gets broken down, and then you go, what do we do with all the hemoglobin? Well, you take the protein component of the hemoglobin, and you break it down, and you release amino acids, and those amino acids can be used for whatever you're going to use them for, right? to synthesize proteins, reused for synthesized proteins. So the, glo the globulin part of the hemoglobin molecule, those globular proteins just get broken down and those amino acids are recycled and reused in other processes. The heme group, right, gets the iron stripped from it. So the iron gets stripped from the heme group and it gets tagged or pinned to a little molecule known as transfer, transferrin, which means the transfer of iron because ferric is iron. And that iron moves either from the spleen or the liver, <coughs> from the spleen or the liver, right? And ultimately gets stored in the liver in the form of ferritin. When you are looking at your iron storage capabilities, some anemias actually stem from iron storage disorders. So they'll run an iron test on you. They'll also look at your iron storage, which is your ferritin levels. So that's just there. That's a point of interest. That iron, right, when it ne is needed, for example, in the synthesis of red blood cells or in the synthesis of hemoglobin, which is necessary for red blood cells, gets shuffled over to the red bone marrow in those uh, cells then can use that in order to make the, the hemoglobin molecule, so it gets recycled. The heme group gets taken off where it essentially becomes bilirubin. Now, bilirubin is a component of bile. Bile is pushed into the common hepatic duct and released into the lumen of the small intestines where it functions as a detergent for fats. Bilirubin is converted to a substance called urobilogen by bacteria. Some urobilogen gets reabsorbed along the GI tract, and then it's filtered out by the kidney and eliminated in the urine. That's what makes urine yellow. So the yellow coloration to urine is actually a byproduct of the breakdown of red blood cells. The remaining urobilogen in the large intestines gets converted to what's called stericobilin, whereas bilirubin is a yellow compound, urobilogen is a yellow compound, stericobilin is a brown compound. So stericobilin then gets eliminated in the feces. That's why fecal matter or poop is brown. So that brown coloration to poop is indicative of the cycling of red blood cells. It's a breakdown product of red blood cells. So if you're having pale poops, that can actually be indicative of problems with blood cell formation. It can be, you know, it can be an indicator of certain types of anemias or certain problems with the way that that uh, red blood cells are cycling themselves. So, um, stericobilin. <coughs> If the liver is not getting rid of bilirubin appropriately, bilirubin starts to build up in the body and it can kind of, because it's uh, fat soluble, it can kind of embed itself in the skin and it can turn the skin and the eyes, like the sclera of the eyes, yellow. And that's called jaundice. It's, one word is hyperbilirubinemia, another word is jaundice. Jaundice is really, really dangerous because bilirubin is neurotoxic. So it can cause all sorts of problems if the concentrations are too high and it can get right across the blood-brain barrier and it can cause all signs of sorts of cognitive deficits and developmental deficits in like infants, for example. So you pay really close attention to that. And the reason that infants tend to suffer from uh, jaundice or elevated bilirubin levels, especially if they're preterm or preemie infants, is because their liver isn't functioning at full capacity yet, right? When the liver is functioning at full capacity, bilirubin should essentially almost entirely be eliminated um, via this pathway. It should be pumped into the GI tract, converted to stericobilin, and pooped out. Now, when you think about genetic diseases impacting any part of the body, which is our final learning objective for today, DNA, which you find in the nucleus of cells, right, 
is you have 46 long strands of DNA wrapped around histone proteins come together to form chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad. On each chromosome, you have functional segments of DNA called genes. We have approximately 20-something thousand genes. Every gene through the process of transcription is used to make RNA. This happens in the nucleus of every cell in your body. RNA then wiggles out of the nucleus, binds to a ribosome, and the information from that RNA is extracted and used to make proteins. Those proteins, in a very real way, make you. Right? So when you think about genetic disease, all genetic disease really boils down to this. If you screw up the DNA, you screw up the RNA. If you screw up the RNA, you screw up the protein. If you screw up the protein, you screw up that protein's function. There's the pathogenesis of all pathogenesis or the, the um, <clears throat> disease pr um, pathway of all genetic diseases in a nutshell. <clears throat> so when you think about sickle cell anemia, sickle cell anemia is a point mutation, meaning it's a mutation to a single base pair, a single letter in the genetic alphabet out of 3.2 billion letters. It's pretty trivial, right? You'd think, oh, one letter is not going to make a big difference. Well, you screw up the DNA, you screw up the RNA, you screw up the RNA, you screw up the protein because DNA is really just information for making proteins. So in a healthy individual, you got a good gene for hemoglobin, right? That gene through the process of transcription makes RNA. That RNA through the process of translation makes a protein. That protein is hemoglobin. It folds in a, to the, in a certain way, and its job is to carry oxygen around in the blood. So red blood cells are just big sacks of millions of hemoglobin molecules. If you change just one letter, right, you screw up the DNA, you screw up the RNA. You screw up the RNA, you screw up the protein. In this case, you swap out one amino acid for another. That changes the shape of the protein. When that protein gets screwed up, that hemoglobin becomes sticky, and those hemoglobin hemoglobin molecules stick to one another and form these long rods, right? They form these like sickle-shaped rods, almost like tentpole rods, right? So they're not supposed to stick together, but when they have this little mutation, they do. You screw up the hemoglobin, you get these long rods, you screw, screw up the protein, you screw up the cell. So now the cells, right, because that hemoglobin is sticking together and it's forming into these rods, take on this kind of sickled appearance. This is called sickle cell anemia. It's a genetic disease. So if you screw up the DNA, you screw up the RNA, you screw up the RNA, you screw up the protein, you screw up the protein, you screw up the cell. Well, if the cell's a red blood cell, you screw up the cell, you screw up the tissue. That tissue is blood. The job of blood is to transport materials through the cardiovascular system. So you can see these sickled cells here in the sickle cell anemia, right? If those cells aren't able to transport oxygen very effectively, you screw up the cell, you screw up the tissue, you screw up the tissue, you screw up the organ, you screw up the organ, you screw up the organ system. In this case, the cardiovascular system isn't delivering oxygen very efficiently throughout the body. That's going to have downstream impacts on every other system. So you don't think about these very small things that dictate what happens at the macroscopic level, but that's where disease is happening. You screw up the DNA, screw up the RNA, screw up the RNA, screw up the protein, screw up the protein, screw up the cell, screw up the cell, screw up the tissue, screw up the tissues, screw up the organ, screw up the organ, screw up the organ system, screw up the organ system, massive systemic effects. So people with sickle cell anemia have d difficulty delivering oxygen throughout their body. They have exercise intolerance. Those red blood cells get caught up in their capillary networks and put, produce what's called sickle crisis, which is a really painful, right, kind of systemic body pain, all sorts of things. So that's it.